we're on. Welcome, friends, into the bachelor pad. We're going to have a Bible study for the next, uh, oh, 48 or 50 minutes or so, just under an hour. And uh, the purpose of this Bible study, some of you know that there was a, uh, uh, a debate that we were part of, a debate discussion with the um, speaker for another radio program called The Narrow Path, Steve Gregg, nice guy. Karen and I enjoyed having uh, lunch with he and his wife. We uh, strongly disagree on the subject of the Sabbath and the New Covenant. Um, following the debate, which was uh, very successful, meaning a lot of people participated, the church was full to overflowing, had about 640 people that were there at the Granite Bay Church, over half of them were probably not members of our particular church, and a lot of visitors, and there have been over 250,000 views of that debate on the uh, website. Well, following the, um, the discussion, the debate, the next day, uh, our brother Steve Gregg uh, rented a local, local elementary school and then reviewed the debate with uh, some of his supporters. I would have gone. It was right up the road from us. I didn't know about it and uh, went through the points that I presented. Um, someone sent that to me, and I thought, well, you know, I'd like to have an opportunity to um, kind of debrief on the debate and maybe a rebuttal of some of the questions. You know, I won't have time to play it because he spent about two and a half hours, this is Steve, at the school sharing. Um, but before we get into that, we just have an opening prayer. I want to remind everybody, join us please tomorrow evening, or tomorrow morning, I should say, at Granite Bay, I'll be teaching Sabbath School. It will be lesson number four in preparation for the end times. And then in addition to that, I'll be preaching a sermon, which is Armageddon uh, Part One, the Battle of Armageddon Part One. And, and you're invited to uh, join us for that. So uh, before we get into it, I'd just like to have a, a brief prayer with everybody. Father in heaven, thank you for this opportunity to do a study with hundreds, if not thousands. And I just pray that you will uh, bless as we review these important points uh, from the study on the subject of your word. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'll remind you, we're, this is in the bachelor pad. This is where I do most of my study. And uh, we did, used to do a Friday Night Live a few years ago. We've been traveling a lot, so it's not always easy, easy to do that. And here's Mrs. Bachelor. She can say hi. Hi. <laughs> and uh, you may not hear her as well, because I'm just using my phone. For this and so I've got uh, a little wire plugging in the microphone on my phone but um, a, a number of points that Steve Gregg was making that I would respectfully disagree with is um, that for one thing he said that uh, you know I think the foundational point that we need to deal with uh, he does not believe that the Sabbath was established in the Garden of Eden on the seventh day of creation as a matter of fact, once people become persuaded that that was the case, uh, it's really, as you would say, a slam dunk after that. Uh, because his whole premise is based upon that the Sabbath did not appear in history among God's people, that there was no place for it, that God never commanded anyone to keep it until uh, at least the giving out of the manna. Well, I just think that it's a self-evident truth when you consider that God creates the whole world he makes the perfect environment for man. He then takes uh, one more day. He's finished making everything, but he, we don't have a six-day week. We've got a seven-day week. And the reason we have a seven-day week, and of course they numbered the days in the Bible, they didn't have the typical names, is because God made one more day, and he made the day for mankind, man and woman and humanity. And that's why Jesus says in Mark chapter 2, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Man was made first. The Sabbath was made later to be a blessing for man. And then God blesses the day. He sanctifies it. And it's just inconceivable to me that God would here set aside this day, call it holy. That's what it means to be sanctified. And now he makes man in his image. And man is not expected to acknowledge or recognize the day that God has made holy. And if you have any doubts about it being made holy back there in Genesis, you just read it in the Ten Commandments because it says there in the Fourth Commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. For in six days God made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. He's pointing back to it again. And so 
I think it's pretty clear that the Sabbath was established for the human race way back there in the Garden of Eden. And I might mention at this point that um, it's not just me. You think about just all the great reformers. This is not, and Steve several times said uh, during his uh, programs, uh, this is the Adventist belief. And this is, or this is what Ellen White taught. And the Seventh-day Adventist and Ellen White and uh, the Mark of the Beast, none of that has anything to do with the subject of what day is the Bible Sabbath for New Covenant Christians. It's what the Bible says. It's not what a church says. But if you're going to look at what churches say, it's not an Adventist teaching that the Sabbath was established at creation. If you take um, Martin Luther, uh, Zwingli, John Calvin, Augustine, um, Spurgeon, Moody, John Wesley, George Whitfield, it's in the Westminster Confession that was sort of an encompassing confession for Protestants. It's in the Baptist Confession, the original Baptist Confession. They all believed that the Sabbath was established in Genesis chapter 2. So it's not fair or accurate to say this is an Adventist idea. This has been the foundation for Christianity when it comes to the Ten Commandments. Virtually all of those names that I just cited believe the Ten Commandments are for all Christians in all ages. It's not an Adventist teaching. Now they may differ on was the Sabbath changed or does it matter if it's the seventh day as long as it's one day in seven. But the idea that they don't believe that the Ten Commandments are still in effect you know, this is not something that you can say, well, this is what Adventists believe. And then uh, Steve also several times floated the word cult. And so it's a cultish teaching to believe in the Ten Commandments. But, uh, and I, I just suggest you type in the word Sabbath, type in Spurgeon and Sabbath, type in Moody and Sabbath. Listen, they'll say positive things about keeping the Sabbath and they'll point back to creation. So you can tell I'm passionate about that. And by the way, Ms. Batchelor is here. She's kind of surfing online because we're inviting you to send in questions. She may periodically inter interrupt me. One of the challenges we have is that questions go by pretty quick. You got one? What is the covenant given? In, uh, what, please explain what the covenant given to Abraham was. Well, you've got the covenant there. God says in uh, Genesis chapter 12, he said, In your seed, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. See, you notice it's not just a blessing for the Jews. All of the nations of the earth would be blessed through Jesus and the new covenant. And if you look in Jeremiah 31, 31, or if you look in Hebrews chapter 8, who is the new covenant made with? God says, I will make a new covenant after those days with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And so to say that um, new covenant Christians don't need to keep the Ten Commandments because the Sabbath was just for the Jews, what covenant exactly are Gentiles saved under if it's not the new covenant and he only makes the new covenant with the house of Israel because we are grafted in to the house of Israel. I was going to wake that up because I might actually play an excerpt a little later. Did you have another one popped in? Can you explain Colossians 2, 16 and 17 about the now, Sabbath being a shadow? <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, Miss Bachelor, did someone write that in or was that something you oh, want me to yes, do? Yes, that was written in. <laughs> Karen said, you got to make that clear. All right, so if you go to Colossians chapter 2, uh, here he's, he's talking, he says, you have to go back to uh, verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, notice right there he's talking about circumcision, which is part of the ceremonial law. The Sabbath of the Ten Commandments was established at creation before there was any sin. He said, um, has made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, and wiped out the handwriting of requirements, ordinances, that was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, first of all, it says handwriting. You've got two parts of the, the covenant. You've got God spoke all these words, and he wrote with his finger, and then Moses with his hand, he wrote down the ceremonial laws and the ordinances and these are the things that were nailed to the cross, as well as the part that says the debt paid in full. And so let no one judge you in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths, which are shadows. It says Sabbath's comma. The sentence isn't over yet. What Sabbaths aren't you to be? Like if I say, uh, 
uh, to my teenage son, you can go out and you can drive. And if I just stop right there, he's going to think you can have the car. I can say, you can drive the vehicle that has, which has two wheels. That specifies which vehicle he can drive. It's the bicycle. And so he says, which Sabbaths are a shadow of things to come. All of the annual ceremonial Sabbaths, they were shadows. And so uh, you don't find anywhere in the Bible where he says, you don't have to keep any Sabbath and there's no holy day anymore. Um, that's another point I should mention that Steve says several times that there's no command that we should come together and worship on the Sabbath day. I respectfully disagree. I think there's scores of commands. You could take, for instance, in um, Leviticus chapter 23, right there in the first few verses, it calls the Sabbath a holy convocation. That means they came together. Jesus, as his custom was, Paul, as his custom was, they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and the word synagogue means the gathering. They came together. It was a time for corporate worship. You can look in uh, the book of Acts where Luke says, And on the Sabbath day we went out of the city by a river where prayer was wont to be made, and the women gathered together. It was a time of gathering for fellowship. It keeps us accountable when we worship together. And, you know, some people are sick and they can't. And even if you go to Isaiah chapter 66, speaking of the Sabbath in heaven, it says, Uh, from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come and worship before me. Now, if that to me isn't clear, and then you can go through just scores of times where Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath and he healed a man whose hand was withered. He healed another man who was demon-possessed in the book of Mark. Um, you got a question you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, Steve said... And we're leaning over because we're married <laughs> and my microphone's here. Steve said that Jesus broke the Sabbath by healing on the Sabbath, and that made him a lawbreaker. So the conclusion is that Jesus was a sinner. Can you please explain? Yeah, Steve makes the point several times of saying, well, you know, Jesus didn't keep, uh, he touched a leper, and you're not supposed to touch a leper. Now, if Jesus touched a leper and the leper wasn't cleansed, then Jesus would have been contaminated by the leper. But when Jesus touched the leper, instead of the uncleanness going from the leper to Jesus, the cleanliness from Jesus went into the leper. He reversed the polarity, you might say. And so he wasn't being defiled because he cleansed the man on contact. And that was, he mentioned several cases like that. Jesus never broke one of the Ten Commandments. That's why Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 10, he says, I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And Peter says, Christ did no sin. Christ lived a sinless life. Sin is the transgression of the law. Jesus died for our sins because the law could not be changed and the penalty for breaking the law is death. So the idea that Jesus broke the law, that to me I think is the most outrageous thing of everything that Steve said. That undermines the whole purpose of why Christ came. No, Jesus did not sin. He never broke the Ten Commandments. He gave us an example that we should keep them. Can you imagine? Jesus, he commands those uh, laws from the mountain and... Um, he writes them with his finger. He says, if you even touch the mountain, uh, the beast was to be th thrust through if it touched the mountain. It was a holy mountain. God spoke. He met with his people. And he makes this covenant with his people. Here are, the Bible calls it in one place, the ten words that he spoke. Um, it is a perfect summary of the will of God. Okay. Are there examples of the Ten Commandment law before Exodus? Yes, a lot of examples. Did the Ten Commandments exist before Exodus? I submit to you they were simply cartified by Moses. You look at Joseph. Did Joseph know that adultery was a sin when he told Potiphar's wife, how can I do this terrible thing and sin against God? Yes, adultery was a sin before the Ten Commandments. Did Cain know that murder was a sin? Yes, God said to Cain, sin lies at the door. Did Rachel know that stealing was a sin when she stole her father's gods? Well, she tried to hide it, she must have known something was wrong. Did Abraham know lying was a sin when he said that Sarah was his half-sister and when Sarah denied laughing? And you could go on and on. There's a number of examples where they knew that breaking one of the Ten Commandments, and it's not just the last six commandments. Keep in mind, the Ten Commandments were on two tables and they're divided into two parts. You've got the first um, 40% deal, first four commandments, our relationship with God, 
and the last six deal with our relationship with our fellow man. That's why the two great commandments, love the Lord, love your neighbor, is a summary of the Ten Commandments. But if you say, well, I love my neighbor and I love the Lord, so I don't need to keep them anymore, no, that's not true. Jesus said, well, Jesus said through the Apostle John, if any man says I love him and keeps not his commandments, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. And the commandments of Jesus are not different from the commandments of God the Father because all things that were made were made by Jesus. Jesus wrote the Ten Commandments. So I'm trying to go fast because we got limited time. Okay, okay. Um, what can we do and not do on the Sabbath? Well, the Bible specifies it's a holy day, and the whole principle behind the Sabbath is you put aside secular business. Of course, the Sabbath's for doing good, and uh, you know, several times Jesus had conflict with the religious leaders because he said that um, uh, you know he healed on the Sabbath, he broke a number of their ceremonial laws or some of their mores and traditions, and he said you have a fine way of putting your tradition ahead of the commandments of God. Nothing in the Sabbath commandment says that it's wrong to heal a person or that it's wrong to pick an apple off a tree when you're walking by. They condemn the disciples because they plucked some grain that was standing right near them as they're walking down the road and ate it. They're following the law of gleaning and they're just taking what they're eating for that day. There's no harvesting going on. That's legalism. And so Jesus was condemning their legalism. Jesus never, in the seven disputes that he had regarding Sabbath keeping, Jesus never said, you don't need to keep the Sabbath. He always corrected how to keep it. So it's holy time, time with the family, time for corporate worship, Exodus chapter 23. Uh, Nehemiah says it's not a time for buying and selling and regular business. Moses said that it's not a time to go out and to work. Steve made a point. He said, if you're going to keep the Sabbath, you can't even build a fire. Now, God didn't say you can't have a fire. God says you shouldn't kindle a fire. We've got a fire going in the other room. By the way, happy Sabbath, friends. We got a fire going in the other room. I kindled it before Sabbath. And when it got cold in the wilderness, did God expect his people to freeze? Obviously not. He said, you don't need to go gather manna and kindle a fire to cook your food. You can do that on Friday. But if they had a fire going already to keep warm, of course that was okay. Kindling fires, they did not have matches back then. They did not have um, you know, some of the things we can do. You turn on a stove and the fire's going or microwaves. The principle is, it should be easy. I heard one pastor say, every time you go to church, you're breaking the Sabbath because the spark plugs in your engine are kindling a fire. I said, those kind of arguments are absurd. They almost make it sound like God had a dumb idea when he gave the Sabbath to his people. It's God's idea, not ours. Okay. Okay. Many Christians believe the Sabbath was changed to the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, by Paul. How can we explain the truth to them? Well, and you know where they get that? It's interesting that, and I think Steve refers to that also, it's called the Didache, where it talks about when the saints come together on the Lord's Day, they never call the Lord's Day Sunday or the first day of the week. The Lord's Day, when John says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, where in the Bible does it say Sunday is the Lord's Day? They assume that Somehow the Lord's Day became Sunday because Jesus rose on the first day. Here's what the Bible says. Isaiah says the Sabbath is my holy day. Jesus said the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. In the Sabbath commandment, it never calls it the Sabbath of the Jews. It says in uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20, it is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. That's a big difference between saying, oh, it's the Jewish Sabbath, and God saying, no, it's my Sabbath. Uh, one more point that I've got on that. Steve says in his, uh, his uh, statement that, um, well, God never commanded them to keep the day holy. And, and he says in Ezekiel and later in Exodus that the, the Sabbath is a sign for the children of Israel. Uh, it is true the Sabbath was given in a special way to the children of Israel, or I should say they were reminded about the Sabbath. But you've got to be careful about saying because the Sabbath being given to the Israelites means that we're not supposed to keep it. Look at the first commandment. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall not have other gods before me. Now keep in mind, that is part of the first commandment. It says, God spoke all these words saying, here comes the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the house of Egypt, out of the land of bondage. Well, that's obviously being said to the Israelites. So what Christian will say, we don't need to keep the first commandment that was given to Israel. So. 
all of the commandments were repeated to Israel because they were a nation of kings and priests that were to bring the gospel to all the world. And everybody saved is grafted into the stock of Israel. The apostles said, we don't need to keep the ceremonial laws, but of course we've got to keep the new covenant, which is the Ten Commandments written in the heart. Okay. Did the Jews separate the law into ceremonial, moral, and civil distinctions? If so, please cite references. Well, a lot of the laws that are given by Moses were kind of given in a, um, a running discourse. But a number of the health laws are grouped together in Leviticus uh, chapter 18. And uh, some of them are commingled with civil law and social law. But no matter what you might say about those laws being given uh, together, it's clear to see that there are laws that apply to health and sanitation, there are laws that apply to civil government, and there are laws connected with the ceremony. Um, the Ten Commandments, no matter what you say, is explicitly given in a unique, distinct, separate way. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully that answers that. You know, one more thing I just came to my mind while I was answering that question. Steve says, um, Pastor Doug makes Sabbath keeping a salvation issue. Well, I don't make it a salvation issue any more than any other Christian from any church makes any of the other Ten Commandments a salvation issue. Sin is the breaking of God's law. So if someone is going to join the Baptist church and they say, I'd like to join, but I do have a problem, I'm a kleptomaniac. Well, the Baptist pastor is going to say, well, look, you can't get baptized if you're not willing to repent and turn from your sin. He says, are you making that a salvation issue? Or if they say, you know, i got a little problem with adultery, but I'd like to join your church. They say, well, you better get cleaned up. Oh, you're being legalistic. You're making that a salvation issue. I pray to idols. Do you mind? Will that be okay? No, you can't join our church if you're outwardly or high-handedly breaking that commandment. So with all of the other nine commandments, Christians agree, no, you've got to keep some standards. Why are Sabbath keepers called legalists if we say, yeah, the Sabbath is right there among the other nine commandments, and if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. It is something to be kept. All right, you got the, okay. the, your, your questions are streaming in, and this bachelor is trying to write them fast okay. and furious. Wasn't the Sabbath fulfilled in Christ? Well, when you say the word fulfilled, people misunderstand that. You look in... Um, the book of Matthew in chapter 3, when Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized, and John says to him, Lord, I need to be baptized by you. And Jesus disagrees with him, and he says, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. That's the same exact word, Greek word, that's later used when Jesus said, Not one tittle will pass from the law till all is fulfilled. The word fulfilled does not mean do away with. It means filled full. Yes, all of the law was perfectly kept in the life of Jesus. He lived a sinless life, a holy life, and he obeyed God. Now, on that same theme, Steve, in one of his um, arguments, he said, we don't need to be ruled by the law. They were, ruled, they were saved by the law in the Old Testament, but now we're saved by the Lord. And I respectfully disagree. I think nobody is saved by the law. In the Old Testament, the people were saved by the Lord. They were saved by faith. The Bible says, Abraham believed me and it was counted to him by righteousness. Abraham was saved by righteousness and by faith. Uh, nobody's saved by works. They were saved by faith looking forward to the cross. We are saved by faith looking back to the cross. Nobody is going to be saved by the law. Nobody is saved by works. We're just saying you can't delete one of the Ten Commandments and say that one doesn't matter. All right, okay. you got another question? Yes. Can you please explain if taking exams for medical school is breaking the fourth commandment? Well, I, I don't think that taking exams is in keeping with a Sabbath day. It's a, a very secular thing to be involved in study and testing. Uh, in our church, and not just our church, in many Sabbath-keeping churches, used to be in even Sunday-keeping churches, if a person was required to take some kind of a test on the Sabbath day, the church or the letter in free countries like America, they'd write a letter and they'd say, can you please make accommodations on another day because of the spiritual convictions of this person? And in most cases, they'll be willing to make accommodations. 
not so easy in some countries like China and some atheistic countries. Uh, and some people do make great sacrifices to keep the law. Keep in mind, there are going to be people in heaven who are martyred because they would not bow down to an idol. Were they being legalistic? Uh, Steve makes the point that it's better to do good on the Sabbath. And if you need to uh, you know, keep your job and work on the Sabbath day in order to feed your family, well, then that's good. Well, you can make that argument and say, if you need to pray to an idol in order to keep your job, that's good. Uh, so you can't call whatever you want good, and you can't say there's never going to be sacrifices and self-denial and crosses in Christianity. Okay. Well, the end time... I apologize. That, you know, I feel bad. <laughs> Steve is sitting here. He's looking over my shoulder, and I feel like I'm debating him in proxy. But that's what he did in this tape. Maybe I'll play a little of it here, and you can just see... We're not any bigger here in Sacramento than I most places. As many, uh, per capita in a Christian uh, environment uh, as I found here in Sacramento. That might just be because that's the topic of the debate. That's the people that are turning out. But, but I know that you're going to run into this. Maybe you are a SDA. And I want you to understand what the arguments are that they're using that are not really true. I, I basically... Uh, I watched uh, several presentations of Doug's giving his arguments for the Sabbath on YouTube and wrote down some of his arguments, plus, of course, some of them were made in the debate. And I want to just run... All right, I just played that a little bit. Uh, that was the introduction to his two hours. I really can't play all two hours and go back and forth, though that might be fun sometime. What we've done is we've made notes of what the arguments are. You can listen to it yourself. And... Uh, just wanted to know. So the reason I'm kind of debating Steve now by proxy is he, he did that. A lot of people that went came away confused, and I thought, I need to confront some of this misinformation. Okay, you ready? Okay, another question. In Revelation 12, 17, why is the devil wroth with those who keep the commandments of God? Well, anything that they, makes the devil mad, you're probably doing the right thing. The devil hates the law, and so, of course, he's wroth with those who are keeping it because... The devil's argument has been, man, it, God is not fair, and for him to punish people for breaking his law is unfair, and uh, when people do obey, it disproves the devil's accusation. So he's especially angry with the bride of Christ that keeps the command of, uh, commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. By the way, you read in Isaiah 8, verse 16, and 8, verse 20, talks about the law and the testimony, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Okay. I think the reason they ask that question is because if the com Ten Commandments aren't important and the Fourth Commandment being a part of the Ten Commandments is no longer valid, then why does it talk about the commandments in Revelation about keeping the commandments? Right. It's one of the identifying characteristics of God's people. We know that during the Dark Ages that the church slipped far away from Scripture. And the Reformation was to bring people back to biblical Christianity. And I believe the whole world is going to be polarized into one of two groups in the last days. One group is going to have the mark of the beast. The other group is going to have the seal of God. I'm actually talking a little bit about that tomorrow in the Armageddon message. But it tells us that the seal of God is really the law of God written in our hearts. You can read about that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Okay. Will the end times really be over worship or which day we choose to worship? Okay, yeah, and I should also mention with that question, Steve said at several points, uh, something about Adventist, Mark of the Beast, uh, and he you know, threw the, the denominational bomb, the cult bomb, the Ellen White bomb, the Mark of the Beast bomb. All of those are diversions, really. None of that has anything to do with does the Bible say Christians should keep the Sabbath? It's a Bible teaching. It's not a church or a denominational or an Ellen White teaching, though she may agree with that. It's really taught in the Bible. I didn't join the, I, I don't believe the Sabbath because I joined the Adventist church. I joined the Adventist church because I found it in the Bible and I became convinced and I couldn't find any church to go to that I felt was closer biblically with the Bible. What was that question you asked again? <laughs> um... It was about what are the... Uh, oh, can it last day? Will yeah. it... <laughs> Will the 
end times really be over worship or which day we choose to worship? Yeah, yeah. Well, we know the end time debate with the mark of the beast. It says whoever does not worship uh, should be killed. And if they do not worship the image of the beast, well, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and it says in Daniel chapter 7, 25, the beast power will think to change times and laws. Only one of the Ten Commandments is both a time and a law. So why would it surprise people if in the prophetic book of Daniel, chapter 3, the king says, bow down and worship or die. They stand up for God and they're delivered. In Daniel chapter 6, you can't pray to anybody. That's the first commandment except King Darius, or you go to the lion's den. Daniel decides to obey the commandments of God instead of the commandments of the government. And then you read in Revelation, there's going to be a universal law that conflicts with the law of God. There's only four of the first commandments between worship. Most of the other call, commandments are moral, civil laws. The Sabbath would obviously be part of that. And while I'm thinking about it, uh, I've often asked Steve, why, you know, why would you want to keep uh, the other nine commandments, we all know that you could go to any other church and they're not going to say idolatry. Well, some churches think idolatry is okay. Most churches don't think idolatry is okay. They don't think that using God's name in vain is okay. They don't think that um, worshiping other gods is okay or the other nine commandments or the rest of them. Why would suddenly one commandment that begins with the word worship in the middle of the law... Remember. Yeah, remember. Why would that one be one that you delete? And Steve's response is, well, the other commandments are repeated in the New Testament. That's a myth. Show me where in the New Testament you find the second commandment, or third commandment, rather. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's not verbatim anywhere in the New Testament. I think the principle's there when it says the name of God should not be blasphemed and when it says hallowed be thy name. But you find a lot more of the Sabbath in the New Testament and never does it say you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. Okay. God, this person says God did not pronounce the Sabbath holy until he had finished resting on it. Therefore, God could not command Adam and Eve to keep it holy until he had made it holy, which was after the first Sabbath. Well, that's a presumption. Uh, why would you say that God didn't pronounce it holy until after the 24 hours were over? I mean, you can convince me it might take the Lord a while during the fourth day to make the sun, moon, and stars. But within the first two seconds of the Sabbath, he could declare it holy. And so I think that's just an assumption that he waited until the sun goes down and then he surprises Adam and Eve by saying, oh, this whole day that we've just been living, I've declared it holy because I rested. They knew he was resting at the very beginning of the day. Can you please tell us where in the New Testament is the fourth commandment? Well, you can read in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, God spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. That's a reference. Uh, Jesus talks about the Sabbath many times. They talk about keeping the Sabbath, often in disputes regarding his healing. It tells us that he went to church, as his custom was, on the Sabbath day. You read that in stood at the yep, stood at the pre Mark chapter 2, Luke chapter 4. Uh, so, and then, you know, one of the, to me, and it was maybe not fair that I threw this at Steve in my closing, I did get the last word in my closing uh, three minutes. Um, he, he, Steve says several times, well, the disciples, he told them they don't need to keep the Sabbath and that they, he taught them to break the Sabbath. That's not true because after he dies on the cross, it says they went home and they kept the Sabbath according to the commandment and they would not even finish embalming his body because they had learned from Jesus how important it was. There were no Pharisees overseeing the burial. It was just the disciples that took away the body, but they would not finish embalming his body. They waited until after the Sabbath was passed as it began to dawn on the first day of the week. Jesus even kept the Sabbath in his death. He said, it is finished Friday afternoon, just like when he finished making the world in six days. He rested in the Sabbath, sleep is compared to death by Jesus. He awakes to continue his work as our high priest interceding before the Father in heaven on the first day of the week. He doesn't make the first day a new holy day. There was nothing wrong with the seventh day. Okay. What was the purpose of the Old Covenant? Well, the Old Covenant contained the living Word of God. Uh, the Old Covenant, the people said, you know, all the Lord has said we will do. It demonstrated that the people without supernatural help could not keep the law unless it was written in their hearts. 
But even in the Old Covenant, you find the New Covenant. Because God says in the Second Commandment, showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. The key to the Old Covenant is love. That's why Moses said, it wasn't just circumcision in the flesh, it's Moses who said, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart. And so you really find the New Covenant even embedded in an embryonic way in the Old Covenant. Okay. Um, how does the calendar change affect the Sabbath? Uh, some people say, well, we can't really keep the seventh day anymore because we don't know which days of the week are which. That's, again, another myth. No change of the calendar ever affects the days of the week. Uh, I've got here. I've got, oh, I can't. Yeah, can I get up? Yeah. Oh, I can't take it off the wall. I got it pinned to the wall. I have a calendar here I was going to show you. People get confused. They see the days of the week. Oh, you can turn the camera over there and look at it. <laughs> It's right next to my jawbone of a donkey that I've immortalized. Yeah, go to the calendar. There we go. You, you, you see the days of the week, because they're on the calendar where you've got the months, people think any change to the months is going to mess up the week. They've changed the calendar several times. It never changes the weekly cycle of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. When they went from the Gregorian to the Julian calendar, maybe it was from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar, and I think it's 1582, it went from October 5, they added 10 days, Thursday, to Friday, October 15. And so you went from Thursday to Friday, even though you went from the 5th to the 15th in one day, it did change the calendar. It never affected the weekly cycle. Uh, we know in the Bible, first of all, I always think it's funny. People have no problem knowing what the days of the week are when they're keeping Sunday. So if you've got a problem knowing which day is the seventh day, you've got a problem knowing which day is the first day, too. And everybody, when they celebrate Easter, they got Good Friday, they got Saturday, and they got Easter Sunday. And the Jews still celebrate um, the Sabbath on the same day of the week as they have for 4,000 years now. I don't think the whole nation went to sleep and woke up and forgot what day it was. And uh, even the Muslims, they know what day they keep is Friday. And so uh, yeah, it's, I think, absurd. Someone wrote a letter to the U.S. Naval Observatory asking if there was any calendar change that affected the continuity of the weekly cycle, and they said there has been no change that has ever affected the weekly cycle. Okay. Can you please explain 2 Corinthians 3, 6 through 11? It's right here for oh, you. She's got it looked up. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, 6 through, through 11. 11. All right. That's a lot of verses. All right. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so the children of Israel could not look steadfastly at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of the righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Well, I just say amen to all of that. Some people think that, well, it was a letter engraved in stone, and now the Spirit is even more glorious. It's talking about when Moses talked to God face to face, his face was shining. How much more glorious when the disciples talked to God, talked to Jesus face to face. How much more when God became a man and talked to humanity face to face. We not only follow the letter of the law, but we follow the Spirit now. Jesus' teaching was, here's three quick examples. Jesus said, uh, you're not supposed to commit adultery. You've heard it said by them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. One of the Ten Commandments. He said, but I say to you, now here you got the spirit of the law. If you look on a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery. So he said, it's not just the, the letter, the actual action, it's the attitude that becomes sin. Of course, the law says, thou shalt not kill. He says, but if you are angry with your brother without a cause, you're guilty of murder. The law says, you shall not bear false witness. Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. So Christ expanded and he showed, it's not just the action, it's the attitude. It's the spirit of the law. But if you're keeping the spirit of the law, do you ever break the letter? If you say, oh yeah, well, I'm, I'm keeping the spirit of thou shalt not commit adultery, but I'm actually breaking the letter and I'm lying, no, if you're breaking the letter, you're definitely not keeping the Spirit. Same thing with the Sabbath. The Sabbath, spiritually, come unto me and you will have rest. There's a spiritual side. I agree. 
But when you're keeping the spirit, do you no longer need a physical day of rest? Do you no longer need to let your animals rest? Do you no longer need to work six days? Do you no longer need to let a slave rest? So the Sabbath is a very practical moral law as well as a spiritual law. Okay. 1 Corinthians 9... 20. We're leaning together because I got the microphone. 1 Corinthians 9, 21 and 22. Can you please explain those in context? 1 Corinthians 9, 21. All right, let me see. To those that are without law, as without law, not being without law towards God, but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. People are saying, well, is Paul saying the only reason I kept some of the Jewish Sabbaths is so that I could reach the Jews? Yes, that's what happened when it came to the annual Sabbath and feast. Paul tried to become all things to all men. When he was with the Greeks, he approached them. He talked about their gods. When Paul goes to Mars Hill, he says, I noticed all your gods. You've got a statue to an unknown god. Let me tell you about that god. Very clever. He tried to find common ground. But he said, not as though I am without law. He said, but as far as possible, I try to relate to all kinds of people that I can reach them. When I'm with the Jews, out of respect, I'll shave my head, I'll take a vow, I'll go to the temple. And when he was with Timothy, he said, Timothy, you know, we're going to be working a lot with Jews. You might need to get circumcised. But he told Titus, you know, don't get circumcised because you're just caving in. So Paul said, you know, you do whatever you need to do to try and reach people. I hate wearing ties. But I find that I get, uh, it, it, it creates less of a stir if I stand up and I preach with a tie on. And so I become all things to all men. If it doesn't require the sacrifice of any principle, I'll wear a tie, if I've got to wear a tie, to look respectful when I preach. So Paul said, you know, he followed certain customs to reach different people, but never when it violated a commandment of God. Are there any exceptions to keeping the Sabbath holy based on your situation in life? Well, when you, obviously Jesus said, you know, if your ox falls in the ditch, you're driving down the road and you've got a neighbor or somebody that their car is broken down and you can stop and help them, by all means, stop and help them. And it might involve some practical labor. But if you need to help a person, uh, if there's an emergency, if someone needs medical care, by all means, heal them. And so Jesus said, that's fine. But, and you find Jesus teaching. He's picking grain out of the fields. He's healing on the Sabbath. There was nothing in those things that broke the principle of the Sabbath. You never, ever find Jesus sawing boards or hammering on the Sabbath day in his carpenter shop. And so the Bible says, lay aside your secular labor. It's a day that's to be kept in a holy way, a set-apart way. And so we've got to do practical things, you know. Sabbath's not a day where you can't eat. Like Jesus said, Moses said, gather twice as much food. Bake what you're going to bake. Boil what you're going to boil. It's a day where you can take care of practical human needs, a day for corporate worship, but um, it's to be kept holy. Okay. Now, this is not a church's idea. This is what God says. All right. The Bible says the law won't change till all be fulfilled, till heaven and earth pass away. Nothing will change. As if when heaven and earth do pass, then the law will change. Please address this. Yeah, well, the Bible tells us that uh, heaven and earth would pass away before one tittle fails from the law. And the Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And heaven is still there. Earth is still there. Even when Christ comes and he destroys the, the wicked, he's making a new heaven and a new earth. It will not be okay to steal in heaven or lie in heaven or worship other gods in heaven. And so God's law is eternal in its nature. There are okay. A couple more minutes and then uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Okay. Did Hosea prophesy about the change of the Sabbath from Sabbath to Sunday? They, they, yeah, no. no. <laughs> there's, no pro there's no prophecy in the Old Testament about the Sabbath being changed from one day to another. Okay, Steve said the Sunday law teaching is what came from Ellen White. wasn't in the Bible. Can you please address this? That's totally not true. The teaching that the, um, the, the mark of the beast could be connected with Sunday goes all the way back to the time of the reformers. I've got ancient documents that come from the 1600s where they said that it was the, the Catholic Church that changed the law of God. And they said this is the mark of the beast. They claim it's a mark of their authority to put human tradition above the commandments of God. Very early Sabbatarians believe that. This is not an Ellen White teaching. 
So anyone that says that, they're basically uninformed, and a little research will reveal that. Okay. She's looking up another verse. I'm, I never did get to my notes because your questions came in so fast. I, I'd gone through a number of notes. Um, let me see here. Uh, not only for the Israelites, we talked about that. Oh, yeah. He said that circumcision, Steve said, circumcision, Jesus said, is more important than Sabbath keeping. And he cites where they said, you'll break the Sabbath to circumcise your children on the eighth day. Nowhere does it say circumcision is more important than the Sabbath day. Matter of fact, you can look in 1 Corinthians seven nineteen. Jesus said, circumcision is nothing, uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. And I don't see circumcision anywhere in the Ten Commandments. So to put circumcision on that level, Ten Commandments are eternal. Circumcision was a covenant that was made with the Jews. Noah will be in heaven. He was not circumcised. Neither was Adam for that matter. So the idea that circumcision has to do with salvation um, or is more important than the Sabbath, I don't agree with. Okay. Can you please explain Revelation 11:19 and 15:5? All right. Revelation... Does this have to do with this subject? 11, 19, yeah. Okay. The, oh, yeah, yeah. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in the temple, and there were lightnings and thunderings and earthquakes and a great hail. And I think a person is making a point of that. It says that here the ark of God was seen in heaven. And so what was in the ark of God? It was the Ten Commandments. And so this was the very core of what was holy for God, is his word was the center of worship for his people. Whole temple was built around courtyard, holy place, the, uh, what do you call it, the inner sanctum was the holy of holies, and in the inner sanctum was the holy ark, and in there was the Ten Commandments, and the only time you find the word holy in the Ten Commandments is in the Fourth Commandment, where it says, keep the Sabbath day holy. And so, yeah, the Word of God was the holiest thing among the people. I and you to compare it to 15.5. Uh, 15 verse 5? Yes. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And uh, you know, what do they want to know about that? I don't know. Okay. Your judgments have been manifested. You know, I've got to launch into a study on, I'm actually doing a study on the, uh, the vials that are poured out. And this is a preface to what happens in 16 with the seven plagues and the battle of Armageddon. I don't have time to kind of get into that right now. Okay. So let's see. Other questions on maybe, I'm just trying to debrief on some of the comments that uh, you may have heard Steve make, and I want to make sure people are clear. This is a Bible teaching. It's not a Doug Batchelor or a, um, a, an Adventist church teaching. Okay. Can you please explain the difference between worshiping God every day and keeping his day holy? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I've often heard pastors say, well, you know, you Sabbath keepers, you, you keep one day a week holy. I worship God seven days a week, and that'll usually get... Uh, some kind of, it sounds like a gotcha phrase, it'll get some kind of a, a rise of amens out of the audience. But it sounds really good. We do worship God. We should worship God always. We should live lives that bring glory to God. Sabbath commandment says, six days you shall work, the seventh day in the Sabbath, you should keep it holy, don't do any work in that day. That's, that doesn't mean that you uh, are not worshiping God the other day. And it is a day to set aside your secular labor. It is a day that God says we should keep holy. We should come together and we should worship him. And so, yeah, we worship God all the time. You can have a Bible study any day of the week, but God doesn't command us to keep uh, every day holy. On the Sabbath, we're told we keep holy. So when, when the Bible says that the Sabbath was only for the nation of Israel, how do you refute that with a Bible text? Okay, you can go to Isaiah chapter 56, and he says, For as the sons, the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to keep his Sabbath, um, it says he'll make them uh, joyful in his house of prayer. For my house will be a house of prayer for all people. It's not just for the Sabbath. And then you can read in Isaiah 66, he says, All flesh will come together and worship before me. Um, and whenever someone joined Israel and they were grafted in, they ended up keeping the Sabbath. All right, so let's look here. I was going to read it to you verbatim instead of just trying to, to wing it. Uh, let me see. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 6. Also the sons of the foreigner, that's a stranger, the non-Jew, who join themselves to the Lord. I'm not talking about just Israel. To serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be a servant. So what Christian doesn't say, I want to join the Lord, 
love the Lord, serve the Lord. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, new and old covenant, even them I'll bring into my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. It's not a curse, it's a blessed day. And he says, uh, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Jesus, of course, quotes that in Matthew chapter 21, verse 13. So it's for all people. Sabbath, Jesus said, was made for man. And the, the man is anthropos, it's mankind, back in the very beginning. You got more questions streaming in, or shall I go to a couple of mine and wrapping it up go here? Ahead. Go ahead, a couple of yours. Okay, well, let's see here. Um, uh, the law passing away, we sort of dealt with that. Um, is, since you're supposed to do good on the Sabbath, oh yeah, you know, I want to remind people that um, because you might need to do something on the Sabbath day and because anything you need is supposed to be good, the idea that it's okay to break the Sabbath because you need to do it, well, that's not denying yourself and keeping a day holy. Part of serving the Lord is knowing how to say, I'm not going to do what I want. It's not my will, thy will. Um, Steve makes it sound like we don't have to worry about the law anymore. We just need to worry about the will of God, as though the law of God is not the will of God. And maybe this is a good point to close on. Um, the most perfect expression of the law of God in the Bible is the Ten Commandments. If you were going to say, all right, Lord, what is your will? He said, all right, how about I speak it to you with my own voice, not where you just hear it in your head, but the whole nation will hear it at the same time. Very few times does God speak audibly. They, he spoke at the baptism of Jesus. He spoke at the Mount of Transfiguration. He spoke there when he gave the Ten Commandments. He writes it. He says, I'm not going to have you write it. I'm going to write it. And I'm going to then extract a covenant from you. This is my will. Now, let me give you another verse on that. If you go to Psalms 119, verse 44 and 45, it says, So I will keep his commandments and I will walk at liberty because I seek his precepts. Yea, Lord, I love to do thy will. Thy law is in my heart. The law of God is, and that was Psalm 40, verse 8, the law of God is the will of God. Uh, so, yeah, there's no conflict. If you want the best expression of his law, look at the other nine commandments. We'd all agree with that, that God does not want us to lie. He does not want us to covet. He does not want us to steal. He doesn't want us to commit adultery. He doesn't want us to murder. All the commandments, everybody goes, yeah, 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 yeah. But the fourth commandment has been deleted over time. God knew it would happen, and that's why he said, you need to remember it. Well, friends, um, I, I know we've had just kind of a marathon here, and uh, several of you actually wrote me or emailed me and said, Doug, you need to respond to some of the misinformation that was given after the debate without you being able to uh, react. And so uh, that's what I was trying to do. Uh, I'm not gonna bear this out forever and ever. I think that it's, uh, it's out there now. And you know, at some point when you debate, you end up just having to respectfully disagree. I obviously believe that um, the Lord, he says, I am the Lord, I change not. And if there's anything that is unchangeable about God, it would be his law, the Ten Commandment law. And uh, like I said, if you're ever in doubt about what to do, uh, do the safe thing. And it, you do the safe thing, and on Judgment Day, you'll say, Lord, I, ha I wasn't quite sure, but I felt better off to keep the Sabbath holy than to do my own thing and disobey and then find out in the judgment that it was a mistake, that you really meant what you said. Uh, I'd like to tell you that God does mean what he says, and uh, you'll be blessed. If you know these things, Happy are ye if you do them. God bless you, friends. Uh, yes? If you want more information, you should go to SabbathTruth.com. Oh, good point. If you want more information, we've got a website that has the whole history. It answers all these arguments and much more. It's got the whole history. And again, I, you know, I would be happy to sit down and, and uh, spend some time with Steve. He and his wife, lovely people. We strongly disagree on this subject. And I do think it's very important because you're talking about it's not some ancillary doctrine. You're talking about one of the Ten Commandments. Sin is the transgression of the law. And so people need to understand that or they're at risk. And I think this is very important. Uh, throw in one final commercial. Happy Sabbath. Look forward to seeing you. If you want to join us for our worship service tomorrow at Granite Bay, I'll be talking about the Battle of Armageddon Part 1. God bless.